The year is 2011. The event, Super Bowl 45. The Pittsburgh Steelers versus the Green Bay Packers. Aaron Rodgers was MVP. Christina Aguilera sang the national anthem. The Black Eyed Peas performed the halftime show in truly fergalicious fashion. It was peak 2010s in every way, but arguably the biggest moment of the event was an epic two minute commercial titled Born of Fire, better known by its catchphrase, imported from Detroit. As Marshall Eminem Mathers drives a Chrysler 200 through darkly lit Detroit streets and an instrumental version of his song, Lose Yourself, plays in the background, a gritty male voice growls. What does a town that's been to hell and back know about the finer things in life? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, more than most. You see, it's the hottest fires that make the hardest steel. Add hard work and conviction, and the know-how that runs generations deep in every last one of us, that's who we are. That's our story. Now, it's probably not the one you've been reading in the papers. The one being written by folks who have never even been here don't know what we're capable of. Marshall Eminem Mathers parks his Chrysler outside Detroit's iconic Fox Theater. Inside, a black choir adds their voices to the music from the stage as Marshall walks down the aisle. On stage, the rapper turns to the camera and says, This is the Motor City, and this is what we do. The what we do was clear. Detroit has always been the center of American car manufacturing. But how did the city get to the point of needing a Super Bowl ad to sell itself? What was the hell and back referenced in the ad? And what was the story written in the papers? If it was false, then was there a true version ready to be uncovered? Today on Pass Gas, it's definitely not the story you've been reading in the papers. Because when it comes to our podcast, it's as much about where it's from as who it's for. This is Past Gas, and this is what we do. Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about ports. Big thank you to our sponsor this week, Valvoline Motor Oil. I get happy every time I say that they're sponsoring our show. Valvoline is the original motor oil. Not only were they the first patented motor oil brand, they've also had many firsts in the oil industry, like the first high mileage oil, the first synthetic blend, and the first racing oil. All very important firsts to have, if you ask me. Guess what? They've never stopped innovating. They're constantly reinventing their formulas to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road today. In fact, Every motor oil Valvoline makes has been recently reformulated to provide 40% better rear protection than industry standards. That's a lot. It's proven to maximize engine life by fighting the four main causes of engine breakdown, heat, friction, wear, and deposits. Another reason we love Valvoline here at Pass Gas is that they've been synonymous with some of racing history's greats. I'm talking Mark Martin in that wonderful number six Valvoline car, Kale Yarborough, AJ Foyt, and our new NASCAR Cup champion, Chase Elliott. Do yourself a favor and make sure you choose Valvoline Valvoline for your engine, just like I have. I've got Valvoline in my car, I've got that high mileage blend because my girl is over 160,000 miles. She's still ticking thanks to Valvoline. Head on over to valvoline.com slash original to find the right oil for your engine today. Thank you very much, Valvoline, for sponsoring Pass Gas. You guys rock. Thanks to Auto Tempest for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Auto Tempest is a used car search engine that saves you the hassle of searching a bunch of different websites for used car listings. It's searching for used cars all in one place. One search engine, that's all you need. One search engine to rule them all. It's super convenient. No more going from site to site to site, wasting all your day, wasting, you know, you never get to see your family anymore because you're going from site to site, searching for used cars. It's everything in one place. You can find all the cars in one place at autotempest.com. That's why their slogan is autotempest.com. All the cars, one search. Auto Tempest gives you comparison links to other sites so you don't have to search multiple sources. They save you a lot of time. Compare results from cars.com, True Car, eBay Motors, Carvana, plus a bunch more. You can also use Auto Tempest to search sites like Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist and stuff like that. They pull in results from all the top listing sites from the USA to Canada so you can search everything in one place, making it super easy. I use Auto Tempest to search for cars daily. Like I look at that site almost every day. Uh, they have a lot of really good choices and you can search all these sites like they're, like I was saying before. They make it super easy, which is why I use it all the time. It saves me a lot of time. I get to see my, my children. My children is what I call my dog. But check it out for yourself at autotempest.com slash passgas. That's autotempest.com slash P-A-S-T-G-A-S. Thank you, Autotempest. Do you know Eminem's real full name? 
Eminem's full name is Slim Marshall Eminem Mathers Shady. <laughs> uh, I remember seeing that ad um, and thinking, damn, that's a that's a slick looking car. All right. All right, yeah. Chrysler, I see you. <laughs> and then I rewatched the ad. This We yeah. uh, rewatched it this morning. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's not not aged well, that design. Yeah, that updated Chrysler Cirrus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, wait, is, is he? Was he driving a 200 in this car? Yeah. <laughs> like so a 300 would make sense. A 300, 300 would make would sense. Totally it's like kind sense. of a luxury car. Like yeah. this is a Sebring. Yeah. It's a Dodge Dart with leather seats. I, it's true. Dodge Dart, I, notorious piece of crap. I remember this specifically because this is the year that my Packers won the Super Bowl last. Uh, so that was I was the last having time? a good time. Yeah, 2011. Isn't that crazy that Aaron Rodgers hasn't won a Super Bowl since? I thought they like, won like four in the time since then. They've been to a lot, haven't no, they? No, they've, they've, we've won about five in the history of Super Bowls, four or five. No way. Uh, but Aaron Rodgers has only won one. He just let the organization know that he doesn't want to come back. So that's a huge Ooh, blow to my heart. Well, if you haven't been to the Super Bowl or if you haven't, if you haven't won a Super Bowl since 2011, 10 years ago, I, you know, I, I feel him. I feel him. Yeah. yeah. Although he has been here, been there his whole career, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. That's kind of a, that's. I like him. I like him because he wears the black shoes. He wears black cleats. Yeah, he wears black cleats and he hosted Jeopardy. He guest yeah. hosted Jeopardy. So maybe, maybe he doesn't want to play. Maybe he can come to Donut. Aaron Rodgers, <laughs> if you're listening, I think there's probably a 98% chance that you are. Yeah, I mean, uh, we still are like taking other submissions for hosts, t- but sa- we'll consider you. Let's take a general, Aaron. Let's talk about it. Me and Jesse, Matt, we'll sit down with you, see what you want to do in your future. Maybe, we, maybe we have some stuff that'll align. You can do a green yeah. screen show. Maybe Greg Jennings is interested as well. But anyway, this is not a football podcast. This is a past cast. We are an automotive history podcast. Uh, welcome to the show. I'm your host, Nolan Sykes, joined as always by. Uh, the other hosts of the show, I got James Pumphrey. Ooh, is that a free blow pop? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Joe Weber. Keep it juiced. And yeah, we, we got Greg Jennings over there. Anyway, uh, yeah, as, as we mentioned in the in the intro, we are talking about the history of Detroit, a city I know nothing about. Uh, I'm not well traveled along uh, among these lands. Have you boys ever been to Detroit? I have not. Yes. Tell me about it. Uh, it looks like Gotham City. There's steam coming up out of the manholes. Love it. Uh, their food that they're known for is Coney hot dogs, chili dogs. And pizza. They have a specific type of pizza, too. It's got the sauce on the top. Uh, oh, interesting. I love it. I think it's a really cool city. Detroit is a good show. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Uh, I think... Uh, I think Lance Reddick is on there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's get into the story. Detroit, here we go. This is a story about a comeback. But what was Detroit coming back from? And what was the city like at the height of its glory? To understand, let's start at the beginning. Detroit was founded in 1701 by French explorer Antoine de la Motte Cadillac who led a band of 100 settlers to build a fort on the bank of the Detroit River. Yeah, he's named like the car. Yeah, he was actually named after the car. Yeah, he's like, I love El Dorados. <laughs> <laughs> Cadillac's name would live on hundreds of years later as the name of a car company, as we just joked about. But before it was Motown, Detroit was Fur Town, providing <laughs> a hub for fur traders to ply their wares and buy supplies. Just like you could have any color Model T as long as it was black, back in the 1700s Detroit, you could have any coat you wanted as long as it was made of fur. As long as it's made of fur! Ha <laughs> ha! Fast forward to 1903, and Detroit was now the 13th largest city in the U.S., with a population close to 300,000 people. And that was the year that one of its citizens, a man we know and kind of love, I guess, as Henry Ford, founded a car company that shared his name. Some of the same factors that made Detroit a popular destination for fur trading 200 years earlier made it a suitable candidate for the hot new automotive industry. Detroit was centrally located for distribution within the United States, with well-established rail and water routes to the major destinations of Chicago and New York City. 
Still, a lot of historians argue that other Midwest towns shared a lot of those same strengths, and that it was actually the dumb luck of Ford and some other car guys being in Detroit that led to the area's reinvention. Who knows, maybe if Henry Ford had been born in Wisconsin, Eminem would be doing an ad about Milwaukee muscle instead. Well, Eminem would have had to be from Milwaukee as well. Dude, butterfly effect, dude. Henry Ford starts Ford in Milwaukee. Marshall Mathers uh, <laughs> grows up on Nine Mile in Milwaukee. I don't know. No, it's Seven Mile, Seven Mile Fair. But Damn also, it. It what, if I, what if I nailed that? What if I just went one digit down? Yeah, I would look yeah like that would have been great. Geo guesser God with yeah, that. Yeah, you would have looked like you knew geography. No, uh, I mean, it, it would have been Cuckoo Cow. We all know that uh, singer of my projects. Remember that song? No, no. He was a uh, the pride of Milwaukee. Uh, <laughs> listen to my projects. <laughs> pride of Milwaukee, baby. <laughs> anyway, back in Detroit, although hundreds of car brands are founded throughout the United States in the early 20th century, Detroit's dominance quickly solidified, led by Ford. Back then, all car companies were essentially startups, and Detroit functioned a lot like Silicon Valley. The more the city's industry thrived, the more it continued to attract additional talent and investment. By 1915, a stunning 13 out of the 15 most popular American car companies were based in Detroit, earning it the nickname Motor City or Motown. Motown, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Motown, baby. By 1920, Detroit was booming, beyond booming, in fact. While its population was 500,000 in 1910, it doubled in 10 short years, reaching 1 million by 1920 and making Detroit the fourth biggest city in the United States behind only New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia. I've never heard of any of those cities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's crazy like how over time like populations change and yeah. like small th those cities that were huge back then, you don't even hear of them anymore. They're just ghost towns now. Yeah. I know, like New York used to be thought of as like uh Pensacola. Like Pensacola yeah. now, Pensacola, Florida. Yeah. Biggest city in the country, Boom right? Town. Yeah. yeah. Insane. It's insane. The big crab cake. <laughs> <laughs> By 1950, that number was a staggering 2 million. Detroit was also highly diverse with a huge population of immigrants as well as black Americans who came to the city in search of jobs. Since 60% of Detroit's jobs were in the auto industry, it meant that a big part of made in America meant made by black people and immigrants. All right. A huge system of highways was built around the city because of all the cars and they needed places to drive allowing for easy transportation from the rapidly growing suburbs. Electric streetcars ran throughout the city in a grid that spanned 534 miles. Although we associate Detroit with urban ruins and decay now, in the 50s, all those ruins were glorious art deco theaters, shiny banquet halls, and bustling offices full of men smoking cigarettes. And drinking whiskey and eating whiskey, steaks. Whiskey, eating steak for lunch. <laughs> These included the Fox Theater that Marshall Eminem Mathers walked through, as well as Michigan Central Station, a 13-story monolith built in the Beau Art style by the same architects who built Grand Central Station in New York. Hmm. Cars were key to Detroit's growth. They were also an important ingredient in creating America's middle class. Picture that Life Magazine-style nuclear family of the 50s. There's always a new American car in the suburban driveway. In Detroit, many white Americans were living that dream. Even those with basic education could get a job on the line and feel like they were safely within the thriving middle class. But just like any dream, it wouldn't last. Hmm. Arguably, the earliest sign of clear trouble for Detroit was in 1958, when the Packard Motor Company went out of business. Before World War II, Packard was like Detroit's version of Rolls-Royce, making massive deluxe cars for America's elite. As president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt actually gave Packard limos as gifts to several world leaders. But after the war, Packard stagnated as its competitors transitioned away from building pre-war behemoths. That's a flex, dude. Yeah, I wish we were rich enough to just be able to give each other cars, because that'd be tight. Hey, all Here's a Packard limousine. <laughs> Happy uh, graduation. Here's a Packard. 
An additional turning point came when Packard made the disastrous decision to buy its competitor, Studebaker, which turned out to be in even worse financial shape than Packard. The combination of bad financial decisions and lack of innovation, for example, Packard failed to include air conditioning in many of their flagship cars, led to the end of the once famed company. My Chrysler has air conditioning. I mean, it has the bones the for air conditioning. Uh, yeah. In 1952. So they weren't having air conditioning in the late yeah. 50s. Come on, son. Best we can do is give you a big block of ice and a little <laughs> a little fan. We'll give you a, every month you can come back and redeem a token to get a brand new block of ice to put on your seat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at this Packard. <laughs> I think I'll buy Studebaker. And I'll, why nobody wants to be cold in the car. Everyone wants to be hot, hot, hot. Here's your Studebaker all the way over here. This is my gas pipeline. <laughs> why is Daniel Day-Lewis telling me a Packard? <laughs> Packard was a warning sign for what was to come for what became known later as the big three of Detroit. You got Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors. But the same issues of bad design and poor management were also true on a municipal level. The city of Detroit was showing some cracks in its beau art facade. Racial tensions were also mounting in the city, as living standards for black Detroiters lagged behind their white counterparts. Many of those white elites were moving to the suburbs and taking their money with them causing Detroit's tax base to shrink as taxpayers moved out of the city center. White flight happened in L.A. too. The auto companies followed the same pattern of outward migration. GM, Ford, and Chrysler spent billions of dollars in the decade after World War II building a staggering 25 new auto plants. But every single one of those factories was located not in Detroit proper, but the suburbs. While the white unemployment rate was stable at 6%, by the 1950s, 15.9% of black Detroiters were unemployed. Even when black workers could get jobs, they were often given the most dangerous and less desirable assignments, like working in the foundries. What's a foundry? That's where, like they, where uh, they smelt. Where they smelt metal. Yeah. Oof. There's a huge foundry next to uh, California Speedway. Cool. For how badly they were treated, it was black Detroiters who created a cultural moment that became an international sensation. Talking about Motown. Led by Barry Gordy, a Detroit-born record executive who founded Motown Records, acts like Stevie Wonder, Smokey Robinson, and Marvin Gaye, amongst countless others, would sell millions of records whose sound was inspired by the electric energy and spirit of Detroit. I noticed that Thomas left off Rockwell from this list of artists. Uh... Rockwell was Barry Gordy's nephew who sang, uh, I think there's somebody watching me with Michael Jackson. Remember that song? It I always feel like there's somebody like watching. Like yeah. That song? I love somebody that song. Yeah. That's Rockwell? Me. Well, the rap, the rap part of it is. And uh, if you can tell, he's not that great of an artist because he does that kind of like singing rap. Like Kanye? It was midnight, oh. and we were. It's like Broadway. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> oh, he got the. He's got that Lin Manuel flow, that Lin Manuel Miranda flow. Oh man! After watching the uh, the track explode or song exploder episode on that uh, that Hamilton's song, which one? I forget. Uh, but I like actually gained a lot of respect for Lin Manuel Miranda. But like before, like I was trying to like convince my girlfriend loves Broadway and all that, and she's yeah. like. He's a great rapper. What's the problem? And I was like trying to explain to her. He's not, like the, I know, but like. I tried I'm, watching Hamilton when it came on HBO Plus, and I was just like, of course white people like this. This is yeah. the worst. This is so fucking <laughs> offensive. This is the worst <laughs> shit I've ever seen in my entire fucking life. <laughs> well, it sounds like we have very different opinions. Hamilton, <laughs> Hamilton might be the worst <laughs> I've ever seen in my I've life. I've never and watched I've seen it. a I've lot of terrible it. It it, I so was excited to watch it finally, and I think, you know, maybe I would have liked it five years ago, but it was, like, really hard to watch. Oh, God, Plus. it's just like a f <laughs> high school talent show. Yeah. It's just like, what the fuck? I'm it not giving away my chance. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the rock. So Rockwell, we have we have to thank Rockwell for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it all stems back to Rockwell. Okay. Follow the Rockwell. Anyway. Well, a wave of rock bands followed Motown, including Alice Cooper, Kiss, 
and the Stooges, as well as the MC5, who turns out were kind of some racist. Jerks. Yeah, yeah, some yeah. jerks. It's hard not to connect these musical acts to cars. The same way Detroit seemed primed to be an incubator for car culture, it did the same for music. And with car culture at its peak influence in American culture, Detroit was not just a population center of the world, it was a cultural center too. But great music is often born out of hard times. And ultimately, that was true for Detroit of the late 60s too. Problems came to head in 1967 when black Detroiters rioted in what some call the Detroit Rebellion. On a hot July night, cops raided a speakeasy on the west side of the city. This sparked the biggest riot in over 100 years of American history. An event in which 43 died, 1,189 people were injured, and more than 2,000 buildings burned. If the most inspirational moment of the civil rights movement in America was MLK's I Have a Dream speech, the burning of Detroit was its moment of justified despair and anger with tragic results. It's safe to say that this was the hell that imported from Detroit ad was describing. But at this point, coming back from it seemed impossibly far off. The chaos in the streets only increased the number of white Detroiters fleeing the city core for the suburbs. And now the phenomenon had a name, white flight. A few weeks ago, I was at the office and didn't want my coworkers to know that I was looking up long wavy hairstyles for men and searching the actor who plays Aiden from Sex and the City. That's just kind of embarrassing. I know most of you are probably thinking, why didn't you just use incognito mode? Well, let me tell you something. Incognito mode does not hide your activity. It doesn't matter what mode you use or how many times you clear your browsing history. Your internet service provider can still see every single website you've ever visited. And that's why when I'm at home, I never go online without using ExpressVPN. Doesn't matter if you get your internet from Verizon or Comcast, or in my case, Spectrum, ISPs in the US can still legally sell your information to ad companies. ExpressVPN is an app that reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so your ISP can't see the sites you visit. ExpressVPN also keeps all of your information secure by encrypting 100% of your data with the most powerful encryption available. Most of the time, I don't even realize that I have ExpressVPN on. It runs seamlessly in the background, and is so easy to use. All you have to do is tap one button and you're protected. ExpressVPN is available on all your devices, phones, computers, even your smart TV. There's no excuse not to be using it. I am actually a customer of ExpressVPN. Before they even sponsored the show, I've been using it. I have it on my phone, I have it on my laptop, I have it on my PC. I think internet privacy is extremely important and I do not like how integrated your personal data is to the ad machine at large on the internet. I think ExpressVPN is a product that you have to buy. Protect your online activity today with the VPN rated number one by CNET and Wired Magazine. Use our exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash gas, and you can get an extra three months for free on a one-year package. That's what I did. That's expressvpn.com slash gas, expressvpn.com slash gas to learn more. Thank you very much, ExpressVPN. Great product. Go get it. In the 70s, the social issues that had caused the riot reached the highest judicial level, the Supreme Court. The case was Milliken versus Bradley. Like Brown versus Board of the Education before it, the case was about segregation, but this time within Detroit Metro schools. Schools within the city of Detroit were majority black and got almost no funding, while those outside the city were majority white and got plenty of funding. The question was whether rules about desegregating schools could apply across school district lines. Unlike Brown, in this case, the courts ruled that the area's 53 school districts did not have to desegregate. White people could move to the suburbs, safe in the knowledge that the schools there would not be desegregated with kids from the inner yeah. city. Do you know there are still high schools in Georgia that have like segregated proms? Well, yeah, that's so, that, like that comes up like every other year. There's some news story about it. It's like, what the hell yeah. are we doing? And what do I got to do? What do I got to do to go to the black prom? Uh, DJ, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's what they want. <laughs> you guys ever heard of Bright Eyes? <laughs> you just play the Hamilton soundtrack? <laughs> You're like really into it? <laughs> Where are you? And I'm so sorry. <laughs> It's the last dance, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Been a crazy year. Where are you? 
<laughs> Remember to leave some room for Jesus. <laughs> Y'all like Dashboard Confessional? <laughs> we got five song block. <laughs> I got kicked. I got kicked out of karaoke one time for uh, singing Dashboard Confessional like five times in a row. Really? <laughs> anyway, and to be clear, many of these insulated white people weren't just middle class people looking for a better life for themselves. They were executives, lawyers, and accountants for the car industry who are amongst the wealthiest people in the country. Oakland County, just outside of Detroit, was one of the wealthiest counties in the United States, with massive mansions separated by acres of lavish grounds dotted with swimming pools and horse stables. And horse swimming pools. <laughs> <laughs> now you might be asking, what does this have to do with cars? Well, remember how we compared Detroit to Silicon Valley? While the city's success was dependent on being a magnet for car companies and the talented designers and engineers who worked for them. As Detroit went from a booming American metropolis to a troubled city with major social and economic problems, that magnet was losing its attractive powers all the way up and down the economic spectrum, from immigrants and minorities looking for jobs to highly educated executives thinking twice before relocating their families to Detroit. As Detroit became less appealing, the big three American car manufacturers would look elsewhere in the country and world for growth opportunities. Ford, Chrysler, and GM realized they could build their car plants in the South, Canada, and Mexico, all places where auto unions weren't as strong and they could keep wages lower. Automation also played a role. As technology advanced, fewer humans were needed to build a car. Ford's River Rouge plant, for example, employed a staggering 90,000 workers in 1930. But by 1960, that number was down to just 30,000 and would continue to dwindle every decade to just 6,000 in 1990. Wow. That's insane. 90,000 people. Yeah. I have like this fear of since I since like elementary school, I've had this fear of being like the last one. Just thinking about being one of the last people working in this plant and, you know, like <gasps> it's being closed up is just like. So sad to me. Yeah, the robots are cutting in line. And yeah, in the cafeteria. And they're like, <laughs> "Sorry, sorry, I need my oil first. Beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, 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 beep. And you're like, "Hey," <laughs> just like rolls over your toe. <laughs> yeah, you're like, "Hey, quit cutting me." And he's like, "Would you like me to actually cut you with my laser?" <laughs> yeah. Why do you? Who gave you a knife? Why are you German? Ratchet bot. Yeah. Why are you German? <laughs> <laughs> By the late 60s, Motown was a city with more problems than solutions. But in the early 70s, things got worse. That's right. We're talking about the 1973 oil crisis. Ew, ew, ew. <laughs> the oil crisis was caused by increased tensions in the Middle East, but its consequences reverberated all the way to the Middle West, Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> According to our very own website, donutmedia.com, where you can buy a t-shirt commemorating the oil crisis, the situation was, quote, responsible for some of the most boring cars in American history. Worse than boring, these vehicles were financial flops for the American car companies that were manufacturing them. Cars coming out of Detroit in that era were gas guzzlers, poorly designed or both. And as prices skyrocketed at the pump, consumers said, eh, things, but no thanks. <laughs> We're talking about cars like the Ford Pinto, the Pontiac Phoenix, the Chevy Vega, the Mustang 2, based on the, the Pinto. The catchphrase imported from Detroit is a clear nod to the reality that millions of Americans now choose to buy their vehicles from overseas manufacturers, and the oil crisis era is where that trend really started in earnest. The oil crisis spelled big opportunity for foreign makers whose fuel-efficient cars made way more sense at a time when gas was scarce. For example, in 1973, Honda sold 38,857 Civics in the American market. Two years later, in 1975, that number nearly tripled to 102,389. In comparison, Chevy built 2.5 million cars in 1973. By 1975, the company made 823,000 cars, wow. less than a third of what it had been doing just two years before. Wow. Ford and Chrysler's bottom lines told similar stories. There were also many mystifying management decisions that seemed to add to the problem. 
Just to give one example, GM had a policy that dictated that none of its dealers could own and operate more than one GM franchise in order to avoid direct competition. For instance, if you ran a Cadillac dealership, you couldn't run a Chevy dealership as well. This led many dealers looking to expand their businesses to sign on with Japanese manufacturers, giving foreign auto sales a toehold in the American market and completely backfiring on GM. Yeah, like let... That's I mean, so that's dumb. just like totally, that, that's just totally unheard of today. Like you, yeah, like yeah. they sell Cadillacs at the same dealership that they sell. Chevy. Yeah. Cadillacs, GM or Cadillac, Chevy, GMC, all at the same facility, you know, like it, yeah. that's like a no brainer. Yeah. You don't even need a brain to understand that's a good yeah, idea. You can understand that with no brain. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, it's I, a no brainer. <laughs> oh, that's what that means. <laughs> <laughs> In the 60s, Americans had a bias against Japanese cars. Many consumers assumed the cars were worse quality. But as neighbors and friends started buying Japanese cars, and lo and behold, they turned out to be reliable, the script flippity flipped as <laughs> Japanese cars became known and loved chiefly for their reliability. I pulled a limb in well there. <laughs> nice. Is that how you write raps? Yeah. <laughs> Script flippity flipped. As the oil crisis resolved, Americans returned to buying gas guzzlers, and U.S. car manufacturers partially recovered, although they never regained their previous heights in terms of production numbers. Yeah, because most American cars from the 80s suck too. Yeah. This turned out not to be a zero-sum game. Japanese manufacturers kept their numbers up, showing that Americans had developed brand loyalty to Honda and Toyota, who were clearly in America to stay. By the early 80s, Asian automakers were threatening to Mitsubishi Eclipse their American counterparts. While Ford produced 783,000 cars in 1982, Toyota sold 556,000 to eager American buyers. Catching up. Toyota also like sold a bunch of cars internationally too. So, As you all should know by now, we love everything JDM. And although the oil crisis was tough for Detroit Steel, it created a boom in Japanese cars and Japanese car culture in America. One of the coolest eras for cars of all time. Even beyond its 80s heyday, Japan continued to dominate the global car scene. I would say that maybe the heyday was the 90s, but it's all preference. In 2000, Japan became the world leader in car production. In 2008, Toyota surpassed GM to become the world's largest car manufacturer. Japan was still the world's largest car manufacturer until recent years when they've been overtaken, not by the United States, but by China. Whoa. Oh, because like VW has their plant there. Yeah, there's uh, a few big plants. Foreign automakers. China has their own car companies that we don't even really know about. Like yeah. Geely. Geely, yeah. Do you th- uh, quick digression. Do I mean we're like so insulated from this, but do like people still like refer to cars like, oh yeah, like he's got himself a German car, he got a Japanese car. That's a good Japanese car. Like to me, it's just like that's oh, a car, you know. Like I don't really think of it in terms of yeah. origin anymore. I, th- I think like since the advent of the internet, like things have just kind of evened out, and it's less like our tribe versus your mm. tribe. Like it's it's a little you can find pockets of uh enthusiasts for like any car company like anywhere i think people i think people are super loyal to like european cars i think oh yeah people still think of european cars as the most luxurious because you got audi um like lexus is an exception but i think like but lexus was like copying german right so i think luxury companies i think when people think of luxury they still think of european yeah i I still think german and i think you know american cars have a certain thing like i think that's true like unless it's a muscle car or a mustang or a corvette i think or a truck trucks i think sure. gen- like american like compacts are kind of trash oh yeah um yeah. so i think i think there's definitely like n- i don't know if rightfully so but like it's based in some there is some merit to to the association like japanese compact cars 100 percent the best yeah european luxury cars with the exceptional Lexus, even maybe mm-hmm. including Lexus, 100% the best. American trucks. Yeah. Yeah. American trucks, 100% the best. Big trucks. American trucks Certainly are the, best, the biggest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Detroit's decline, on the other hand, didn't really have an upside. 
From a peak of nearly 2 million in 1950, Detroit's population was down to 1.2 million by 1980. This led to Detroit's famed urban decay, thousands of empty buildings and houses taking up several square miles around the city. While the city was attempting to demolish abandoned buildings, those efforts have led to bizarre areas where only one or two houses are left standing on what used to be a thriving neighborhood block. It's a haunting reminder of the Detroit that used to be. By the 80s and 90s, its citizens had realized that there was no going back. The only way forward was to forge an entirely new path. I just found this photography channel uh, that's uh, called Volandis. He's this dude in Detroit. Uh, does a lot of like street photography. And it's so weird to see these kind of blocks that you just described of just like one or two houses on a block. It looks yeah. like they're out in the country somewhere, but they're in Detroit, you know, just because there's all the, the houses are so spread out. Yeah, there's like the that neighborhood of like old Victorian mansions that are just like all derelict and you know there's like one or two per block and it's just like damn, I want to just go exploring and derelict. Big thanks again to Auto Tempest for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Like I said before, I use Auto Tempest all the time. It saves me a lot of time when I'm looking for cars, which I can't afford, but I still buy them anyways. Auto Tempest is a used car search engine that saves you the hassle of searching a bunch of different websites for used car listings. It's for searching used cars all in one place, like I said. No more going from site to site to site. You can find all the cars in one place at autotempest.com. That's why their slogan is autotempest.com, all the cars, one search. They search car sites like cars.com, True Car, eBay Motors, Carvana, plus a bunch more. You can also use Auto Tempest to search car classifieds like Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist. They pull in results from all the top listing sites from the USA to Canada, so you can find everything in one place and everything is very easy. I use it almost daily. I love autotempest.com. They just they have all the best listings. So check it out for yourself at autotempest.com slash passgas. That's autotempest.com slash P-A-S-T-G-A-S. So they know we sent you. Thank you, Auto Tempest. Another thank you to our sponsor this week. You heard me talking about him before. I'm talking Valvoline. God, it's so cool that I can say Valvoline is sponsoring our show. I love Valvoline, the original motor oil. Not only were they the first patented motor oil brand, they've had a lot of firsts in this industry. First high mileage oil, first synthetic blend oil, and the first racing oil. All huge accomplishments. And they've never stopped accomplishing. They keep never stopped innovating. What? You think they're going to rest in their laurels? They're constantly reinventing their formulas to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road today. If your car is an engine, guys, Valvoline has an oil for it. Valvoline has recently reformulated all of their motor oils to provide 40% better protection than industry standards. 40%, not 10%, not 20%, 40% better protection. And uh, their oils have been proven to maximize engine life, fight the four main causes of an engine breakdown, heat, friction, wear, and deposits. Another reason we love Valvoline here, they're synonymous with some of racing history's greats. Talking Mark Martin, Cale Yarborough, AJ Foyt, and our new NASCAR Cup champion, Chase Elliott, in that beautiful number nine Napa car. So do yourself a favor, head on over to valvoline.com slash original and find the right oil for your engine. And make sure you choose Valvoline just like I did. I've got it in my car, you should too. Valvoline, thank you very much for sponsoring Pass Gas. It's a pleasure. By 2008, the big three had lost over 40% of their United States market share. Oof. The financial crisis that year was the last straw. Luckily, though, it turned out to be rock bottom. The U.S. government <laughs> provided $85 billion in loans to prop the companies up as both GM and Chrysler both filed for bankruptcy protection. But not Ford, though. Not Ford. Ford didn't take that money. Although most of the loans were paid off a few years later, and the general consensus today is that the bailout helped turn around the American economy, the damage done to Americans' ideas of its car brands as permanent titans of industry would never be fully salvaged. As for Detroit, its saviors included countless community activists and proud Detroiters who worked to turn the city around, even when it seemed like nobody else cared or wanted to help. Other figures in the city's turnaround were less likely. For example, Dan Gilbert, a guy you've probably never heard of unless you're really into consumer finance. Which we are. Yeah, we are. We are Dan Gilbert. Yeah, I know. He's... You mean the you mean the goat? You mean well, the goat of consumer finance? Yeah, the goat of <laughs> consumer finance. He's like the freaking LeBron of consumer finance. 
Gilbert had founded mortgage lending company Quicken Loans, and in 2010, he made the decision to capitalize on rock bottom prices and moved his company's headquarters to downtown Detroit. Gilbert was born and raised in Detroit and, ac- and attended Michigan State. Go, go, schoons, schooner boys. I think they're Wolverines. Yep. <laughs> no, that's Michigan. That's No, Michigan. they're the Spartans, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hell yes. yeah. My days of watching college football paid off. I knew it. Go Spooner, Spooner Go dudes. Spooners. The Spooner dudes. Michigan anyway. State Spooner dudes. He attended Michigan State. For him, the decision was as much personal as it was business. From there, the billionaire CEO continued to invest in Detroit, buying over 60 buildings in the downtown area. Side note, he also owns the Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so sorry to you, Dan. <laughs> Quicken's move to Detroit was part of a wave of startup and tech companies moving to the city. In a weird reversal of the white flight of the 60s and 70s, young professionals, mostly whites, were now flocking to Detroit for the cheap rent and job opportunities. Only this time, they're gentrifying. (laughs) (laughs) That's why I was in Detroit. Uh, When Donut first started, we participated in this like tech like competition thing. Oh, weird. And like Matt and uh, Ben are two two of our founders like lived in Detroit for a summer. And oh, was that for tech stars? Yeah, it was tech stars. Okay. And like I was in Detroit for tech stars. That's cool. All of this brings us back to 2011, the year of the famed imported from Detroit Super Bowl ad starring Slim, Marshall, Eminem, Shady Mathers. <laughs> the third. Thank you for saying the his third. full name. Yeah. The watershed moment for the city actually almost never happened for multiple reasons. For one, Chrysler was worried that the Chrysler 200, which was priced at a budget-friendly $18,000, had already received mixed reviews and wouldn't impress a wide public audience. That's true. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The Chrysler 300 was their more luxurious model, with options as high as $46,000. But it was built across the Detroit River in Brampton, Ontario, making the imported from Detroit slogan a bit of a stretch. Hmm. (laughs) Adding to this, the NFL had never allowed a two-minute ad. But the weirdest wrinkle was that Eminem was already set to appear in a Super Bowl ad, a claymation spot for Lipton Brisk iced tea in which a claymation version of Marshall Mathers shoved a corporate exec... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> off the roof of a building hell yeah hell yeah dude <laughs> get out of my face big t yeah <laughs> i'm a lipton brisk boy <laughs> <laughs> but chrysler stuck with their game plan and it paid off chrysler 200 was the number two search google phrase on google during the game beating out black eyed peas a band that once said the r word 24 times in one song. The ad received millions of additional views on YouTube, which although common now was relatively rare in 2011. Of course, there's more to turning around a city than a Super Bowl ad. There are still major struggles in the area. Detroit and its surrounding suburbs take up 139 square miles. 40 of those square miles are vacant. The city is still surrounded by massive freeways catering to traffic that's no longer there. We all experienced some version of this weird urban emptiness in the pandemic. For Detroiters, that's just normal times. Their apocalyptic moment came decades ago and really never went away. Wow. Signs of hope have been more frequent lately. In 2017, a New York Times article headlined, Detroit, the most exciting city in America, ran in the paper. Unlike the heyday of Detroit, when electric streetcars ran on a grid hundreds of miles long, Detroit is the biggest American city without a public transit authority. But recently, what, really? that's that's crazy. That's yeah. crazy. But recently, Detroit opened the Q Line, a three-mile-long electric streetcar that runs through a touristy area of the city. Also, Ford and General Motors are reinventing themselves as mobility companies. Mm-hmm. Although calling Detroit Mobility City doesn't quite have the same ring Still to can it. be Motown, baby. Yeah. That's right. As car companies become increasingly similar to tech companies, Detroit's newfound startup culture has the potential to rub off on its legacy of car manufacturing. 
There's also hope that Detroit's industrial leaders have learned a lesson from the brutal decades of the 70s and 80s. Although the headlines for many years have been focused on outsourcing, Detroit still commands 25% of all new automotive investment. Instead of growing complacent and allowing other countries' offerings to overtake them, the mood in Detroit is that innovation is now part of the game. For example, Ford recently announced they'd invest nearly a billion dollars in creating a hub for the development of autonomous and electric cars at Michigan Central Station, the famous building we mentioned earlier. By the 2010s, it was famous for a different reason, glamorized in a wave of ruins photography, which some people called ruins porn. The station had closed in 1988, and in the following years was ransacked and graffitied by countless urban explorers. Incredibly, Detroit responded to the news of the station's renewal by giving back. Dozens of citizens have come forward to return items that were taken from the ruins of the train station, Whoa. including the massive clock that used to hang in the main hall. Apparently, the clock was left in an abandoned lot before someone called Ford with instructions on where to <laughs> retrieve it. Hey, I got your clock down here. Uh, this is how you get in. You drive through. You're going to no hard experience feelings. a gate. You're going to have to... Pull up the little arm that holds it to the pole. and I left the key under the mat. I'm at work right now. I I set it to 420 because, you know, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, it's probably the nicest time of the day. <laughs> 420, both hands will just be on the four. Oh, 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 oh. Dude, give him back like that. That's Detroit, and that's what we do, okay? We give back the stuff. From that place. Then we go to Telway Hamburgers and get us a slider. Okay? Oh, nice. Good poll. Thank you. <laughs> Meanwhile, GM has announced that production versions of the driverless Cruise AV will be built in the, in the Detroit area. And the company plans to invest hundreds of millions of dollars to build next-gen Cadillac sedans at GM's plant in nearby Lansing. You know, maybe I'll pick up one of those next-gen Cadillac sedans and drive to Mike's famous ham place and get a ham sandwich, huh? Oh, another great poll, man. Thanks, man. Keep them coming. Still, it's a little ironic that America's best-selling three vehicles are the Ford F-Series, Chevy Silverado, and Ram Pickup. They're not exactly cars you associate with the future of ride-sharing and mobility. While automakers' mistake in the 70s was a failure to offer small and efficient cars like the Honda Civic, it seems today's American consumers can't get enough of big-ass American trucks. <laughs> yeah, man, I love a big truck. I'd like to get a truck, put down the... <laughs> Put down the tailgate and just eat a Coney from Lafayette, Coney Island. You know what I mean? Oh, my God, dude. <laughs> three for three. Wow. Bad in a thousand. These are so. just my spots. These are just my spots. These are my Detroit <laughs> spots, you know? These I are... see that you're clicking on <laughs> Google Maps. <laughs> well, that's the story of Detroit, at least in our eyes. It's an incredible city. And if you ever have the chance, you should visit. I want to go. I definitely want to go. If you're a fan of American cars, it's practically Mecca. When Eminem said, this is the Motor City and this is what we do, what was left then said is that what the city does has evolved radically in just a few short years. The new story of Detroit is about thriving, but it's also about resilience. It's not a story that can be told in a Super Bowl ad, but one that will reveal itself in the years and decades to come as the story of Detroit continues to be written. Nice. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Boom. Um, looking at the comments for that Super Bowl ad that we launched the show with, there's a lot of proud yeah. Detroiters in there. A lot of people that have a lot of fond memories of seeing this commercial because when it came on, you know, times are really tough. And this was like a huge, uh, it was like a, a very motivational uh, ad, you know, to see at the Super Bowl. And like some guy was saying that he was working at the plant, he was working at some plant. And he was watching that before work to get hyped up for his shift. And it's like, damn, if that <laughs> hell yeah, if, dude. You know, something yeah. that we, you know, it's a little corny, but like if that's if that's what it means for a city, well, you know, good for them. Yeah, dude. I remember <laughs> watching that video in that Super Bowl. I was 2011, I was eight years old. <laughs> we were watching the Super Bowl. And then afterwards, we went to Polonia and got some dill pickle soup. <laughs> nice. That's a great poll to end this Thanks, podcast man. on. That's what I feel like whenever whenever Nolan remembers stuff, it I feel like he's always six. Yeah. And I was like, damn, I was in college. What the hell? <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I was 18. No, I was about to turn 18 when I saw that ad. I was you know, going to graduate high school that year. 
Eminem was like was, on a roll, by the way, in terms of like ads. You know, he had that one. Yeah. There was the Lipton one, which I don't remember. But also he was like, they used uh, Til, uh, Till I Collapse. They used that in the Modern Warfare 2 trailer. Oh, yeah. Oh. And that was oh. like the sickest ad for a game that I've ever seen. Uh, it still gets me hyped. Dude, I remember Modern Warfare. Me and my friends would just play it and we'd get Buddy's Detroit style pizza and sleepovers. Yeah. <laughs> Where from? Where from? So, from Buddy's Pizza. From Buddy's it's Detroit style. What's yeah. your What's your usual at Buddy's? Uh, I get the Detroit style pizza. <laughs> the no Det- toppings. <laughs> well, I get the Detroiter with brick cheese. Oh, okay. cool. Yeah, brick, brick cheese, cheese, huh? Yeah. <laughs> the, I I like it because the spice blend is particularly gooey and delicious. Wait, Ooh. the spice is spice blend is gooey. <laughs> I'm only reading parts of sentence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I before we head out, I just want to address something. Um, I think we talked a lot of smack about the Ford Edsel in that podcast, and I got an Instagram message from this dude named Trevor Stoddard, mm. uh, who is yeah. re, uh, fixing up an old Edsel, and oh, right. his pictures are super cool. But he said that rearview mirrors were an option <laughs> that <laughs> whoever bought this car didn't have. So I think that was pretty funny. That's pretty well, cool. Thank I, you, I, I also like how you started that with like, listen, I know we talked a lot of trash about this car, <laughs> but yeah. turns out some of them didn't even have <laughs> mirrors. <laughs> he looks cool, though. It's like he's fixing it up. He's doing a great job. And so I just wanted to say not Ed, not every Ed's hole is a piece of crap. And I think like, yeah, just a reminder, like every car is cool. And, uh, yeah. you know, some cars are weird and some cars are weirder than others. So, it's but still, people just, put millions by, of dollars yeah. and millions of hours into making that car. So yeah, by, that's point, cool. by by pointing out the quirks of a car, yeah. um, we are by no means saying that is it's not. It's cool. like when we point out the quirks of Nolan, we still love him. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, and you're like, we got to keep him in check, <laughs> or else his ego is gonna get out of control. Yeah, or like well, when you guys according are like, to my astrology, like, it's not, you know that's just not gonna happen. My ego is in check, <laughs> yeah. according to my star chart. Thank you so much for listening to Pass Gas. This is a kind of a different one than we do, usually do. You know, variety is the spice of podcasting. That's what my grandpa said. The gooey spice of podcasting. That's right. <laughs> variety it's is the gooey, gooey spice, spice blend. Of podcasting. So, thank you very much. Um, Wait, you know, if you're from Detroit, uh, we I've been there. I love it there. So maybe after this is all over, we can all hook up, maybe get some better made uh, potato <laughs> chips. I uh, didn't see that one coming. Maybe go to Sister Pie, get a salted maple pie. I love those. Bucharest Wait, Grill. Salted maple pie? That sounds, yeah, dude, it's a salted that sounds maple delicious. pie. That yeah, sounds really good. Yeah, actually. it's from Sister Pie. It's really good. You okay. would love it. It's yeah, one of my, spo- it's one of my spots. <laughs> if there's ever a donut, if there's ever a donut tour, if there's ever a donut tour. Detroit is like a natural stop. We have to go there. Oh, we for sure, dude. Because we got to get the breakfast poutine at the Brooklyn Street local. That's it right. will blow your freaking mind. Okay, dude. okay. I think okay. This is this is my bucket list thing for Detroit. Uh-huh. If we ever go there, yeah. we have to go to that statue of the arm that's on the yeah uh, that statue is cool and we have to pull it back and and have it punch nolan <laughs> yeah punch him right in the chest because he threw that water balloon at me super hard <laughs> and then after we do that we'll just you know make up by going to slow's barbecue and getting a yard bird sandwich one of yeah, my right. it's just one of my spots it's a you know? plan it's a plan <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for listening to the show uh be kind i love you and keep it juice all right see you next time